Hello, I'm Locke Meredith. I'd like to invite you to join me on the next Legal Lines where we're very pleased to have on the show our United States Senator David Vitter. David's going to talk to us about the big issues that are facing our federal government, our nation as a whole. He's going to talk about the economy, debt, and he's also going to talk about the fact that we have a lot of tensions overseas in the Middle East, a lot of war going on. So join us on the next Legal Lines with our United States Senator, David Vitter. Hello, I'm Locke Meredith, and I'd like to thank you on behalf of myself, Sean Fagan, and Corey Ogeron, and our entire staff for letting us come into your homes for the last 10 years via Legal Lines. We hope that you've come to a greater understanding of how the law works and how the government works for you. So from all of us, thank you. Hello, I'm Locke Meredith. Welcome to Legal Lines. We're very pleased to have on the show again our United States Senator, David Vitter. David, let's dive right back into it. Absolutely. Um, we were talking about the fact that we have to reduce the spending from the federal government. Right now, it's set, given some legislation that took place, that 50% of the cuts uh, come from the military and 50% from the social program. Explain how you think that should occur. Well, first of all, we need to do more than those minimal cuts. Uh, but secondly, I'm concerned about that um, having a real adverse impact on national security. The Defense Department is 17% of the budget. It'll get 50% of this next round of cuts. Way because ba Basically because Congress hasn't done its job. Congress hasn't gone in and done the tough work and made specific decisions in specific spending programs. So we need Congress to get in and do its job and not just throw up its hands and say we'll have these across the board cuts. And, and basically you're saying because we have a, a uh, federal government right now that's divided, the power's divided between Democrats and Republicans, really the tough issues could be tackled because frankly both parties would be blamed for it. Yeah, um, you know, most folks understandably think of divided government as complete gridlock. And obviously that's true a lot of times and it's probably, unfortunately, going to be true this year. But divided government is also an opportunity for people to come together and do some important things that aren't always easy. You know, you think back in history, it was Ronald Reagan and Tip O'Neill. I remember who used divided government to save Social Security for a whole other generation and extend out the life and solvency of Social Security. And that's it where was, we are again. Yeah. We need to fix it or yeah. it's gone. It was divided government under Bill Clinton and a Republican Congress who balanced the budget for several years, who came together uh, on welfare reform. Bill Clinton vetoed it twice, but then he passed he it. He heard from the people. It. Right. And so divided government did those big things. We need to do that again, particularly with big, big challenges like saving Social Security and Medicare. It's not just a question of cutting them, it's right. saving them. Right. Are we going to save them or not? Meaning if we don't fix it, they're going to collapse. Yeah, yeah. Also on the tax side, we need dramatic fundamental tax reform. Simplify the tax code, make it fair, do away with all the special interest loopholes and credits and deductions and use that to lower rates on individuals and on business to make American business more competitive. On the Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid programs, I know we've got folks who get very terrified when they sure. hear that there may be cuts, but I, I think they don't understand that we're talking about uh, minor adjustments that enable those programs to stay uh, in, in place. Yeah, Explain think, to them. Well, I think the first two things we need to say is it's not just a question of cutting these programs. The, the desire, the goal is not to cut. The desire is to save these programs. The question is, are these programs going to be here in the near future? And if we stay on the path we're on, they will not. So it's a matter of saving the programs. Secondly, I, I think we need to reassure current retirees right and folks who are about to retire, say 55 and older, that we're gonna hold them harmless. They have planned on the current rules for a long time, and it's not fair to change those rules when they have planned on those rules for That's their right. entire working lifetime. We're gonna hold them harmless, but for younger workers, we can transition in to some new rules over time. And if you make some gradual changes uh, to retirement age over time, to things like that. 
over time, means testing for Social Security. I don't think if you're making a million dollars a year, you need Social Security. You don't need Social Security. Security, that's right. If you do that over time, those can make a huge difference and still not hurt, not threaten any current retirees or any folks who are about to retire. David, I remember reading that uh, when Obamacare was voted on and passed that it included, as I recall, $500 billion cut from Social Security programs. From Medicare. Right? Medicare. You're thinking of Medicare. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, uh, that was one of my top reasons for opposing Obamacare. You had Medicare, the medical program for seniors, 65 and older. It's already on a pretty short path to, to being done away with because the numbers aren't there, the money isn't there, and Obamacare stole half a trillion dollars away from that already failing program to set up a brand new program. That was just wrong. We need to be doing the opposite over time and saving and bolstering up both Medicare and Social Security for current seniors and the next generation. I know that the, the, the way the Democrats and the Republicans approach taxes is completely different. Um, President Obama is talking about raising taxes to, to address the, the debt of the, the nation, and Republicans don't want to do that. Explain yeah. to the folks why Republicans do not want to raise taxes. Yeah. Well, first of all, as a conservative, I want there to be new revenue to help solve the deficit and debt situation, and that needs to be part of the solution. The question is, how are we going to get that revenue? I want it from a growing economy. I want it from tax reform that adds on to jobs, adds on to economic growth, and revenue grows with that. A lot of liberals, like the president, want it from just simply jacking up tax rates, increasing tax rates on a lot of folks. And my concern with that is that that often chokes off economic growth. As we try to come out of this horrible recession, that's going to make it even more difficult. And, and my recall is, is that the, the proposal by President Obama is to raise taxes on the, quote, wealthy, which has been defined as any individual who earns more than 200 grand or a married couple 250. Right. Uh, and so he's going to raise taxes on those and I guess keep them the existing tax rate that President Bush put in place. Why is that? Ineffective. Well, first of all, that's the promise. If you look at the Obama record, it's quite different. If you look at Obamacare, for instance, there are significant tax increases, fee increases, cost increases that affect a lot of people below that income level. So um, the promise is one thing. The reality and the record is something else, and I'm very concerned about impact on middle-class taxpayers. Secondly, even if that promise is kept, while it may not affect tax rates for middle income people, it can certainly affect employment and the economy. Right, because that's really why we're people. talking about all yeah. this stuff. And, is And what folks want more than anything is a job and security about their job. So even if they're held harmless in terms of tax increases, that's going to be a little consolation if they don't have a job, right. if they lose a job, if they don't have a job and it's tougher to get one. So what we really need to make sure is that job growth is healthy. And so the Republican argument uh, that I've heard is, is that, look, if you raise taxes on the folks that we've just indicated would have them raised on, they're not going to have money to invest in businesses and products to create jobs. Absolutely. And a perfect reason is that a lot of small businesses are organized in such a way that the owners of that business pay through the personal income tax rate. You know, they're not corporations. They're set up so it's a flow through and the taxation is through personal rates. Well, a lot of those small businesses, truly small businesses, backbone of our economy here in Louisiana, elsewhere, get bumped up to the top rate. Right. And so that tax increase is on them. Now, you know, to hear President Obama and liberals in Washington talk, these are all gazillionaires sipping pina coladas on a beach somewhere. Just not the case. That's not the case. There are a lot of small businesses that would be impacted. All right, we'll continue this on the next segment. This is Locke Meredith with Legal Lines. Our United States Senator David Vitter will be right back. Hello, I'm Locke Meredith, and I'd like to thank you on behalf of myself, Sean Fagan, and Corey Ogeron, and our entire staff for letting us come into your homes for the last 10 years via Legal Lines. We hope that you've come to a greater understanding of how the law works 
and how the government works for you. So from all of us, thank you. Welcome back to Legal Lines. I'm Locke Merritt, and again, we're very pleased to have on the show today our United States Senator, David Vitter. David, Thanks again, Locke. Appreciate thank, being here. Thank you. Um, we were talking about, uh, to summarize real, real quickly, that we have this huge debt. We've got to reduce spending in the military and in the entitlement programs. And we've also uh, got to deal with revenue coming into the federal government via taxes, but in a, in a very logical way. Yeah, and revenue growth has to be part of the solution. We need more revenue. The real disagreement is, how do we get it? I want to get it by growing the economy, by having a fair, simpler tax code, which will add on jobs, promote economic growth. Uh, liberals want to get it by just jacking up rates, which I think would do the opposite in terms of making it tougher for the private sector to grow those jobs. And the reason is, uh, at least in, in my thinking, is, is that there's not a whole lot of things that I can look at that the federal government has done efficiently and very effectively compared to the private economy. So if yeah. you leave the money with the private economy, there, that money is going to go to the place where it is most needed and it's going to do it the most efficiently because people want to make money. Yeah, absolutely. Look, there are some things only the federal government can do. Sure, military. National defense is the obvious example. Another good example is the federal highway system and interstate system. Private industry alone on its own isn't going to build that. There is a necessary role for the federal government. But you know, beyond that necessary role, the more the federal government does, I think the more it hampers, in a lot of ways, private industry job growth, and it's a very inefficient way to grow the economy. Let's talk about, when, when you talk about growing the economy and how that in and of itself will generate more revenues for sure. the federal government, I kind of think of it, you know, people think we've got this pie, it's only this big, and it's yeah. not going to get any bigger. So if you're getting a slice of the pie um, that's, say, 20%, uh, it is what it is, yeah. and there's no chance to grow the pie. But yeah. if the pie becomes this big, yeah. you're what, getting a big, big piece of different it. Different policy out of Washington can dramatically impact whether that pie is stagnant or even shrinking or whether it's growing. And right now, we have way too small a pie considering the size and, and potential of our nation. We need to grow that pie much more effectively, and that will, of course, grow revenue with it. All right. And You've talked about a fair tax or a flat tax or a, you know, a way of dealing with the tax code better. I know I'm not using the proper terms. Explain yeah. that in a little more detail. Well, actually, uh, one hopeful sign is over the last few years, there's been a lot of bipartisan consensus forming over this. And the idea is to dramatically simplify the tax code. Meaning what? Like every American... Uh, nods at that, <laughs> meaning get rid of almost all of the special interest deals and specific exemptions and deductions and specific provisions of the tax code. Get rid of that and use that to lower rates. So you lower overall rates for individuals as well as businesses, but there aren't these special deals and special exemptions. You could do that in a way that raises the same amount of money in day one but it would really encourage economic growth and it would spur economic growth so that over time it raises a lot more money and you have increased revenue. Well, let's talk about another component that inhibits or reduces the ability to grow the pie. We talk yeah. about tax policy. Let's talk about regulations. Yeah, absolutely. It's killing business from what, everything I read. Absolutely. Now, once again, you know, there's some base level of regulation I support, virtually everybody supports. Sure basic health and safety and environmental regulation. Nobody's talking about getting rid of that. Uh, what I'm talking about is, is getting rid of this recent avalanche of over-regulation that's occurred uh, over time, but particularly under President Obama. You know, a perfect example of that is his EPA, particularly as it intersects with our Louisiana energy industry. Right. There's just been an avalanche of regulation way beyond what's needed to protect important health and safety, which all of us support. And it's been depressing the energy industry and making it tougher and tougher to grow jobs in that vital sector. And that's bringing to my mind this whole Keystone, Keystone Pipeline yeah. uh, issue. Explain to the folks what that is and, yeah. and what happened. Well, the Keystone XL Pipeline is a proposal that's been on the books for years, waiting for a permit 
from the Obama administration. I've read three years, right? Yeah, they've been studying it for three years. This is a big pipeline proposed from the middle of Canada down through the heartland of our country to refineries in Texas on the Gulf Coast. Uh, it's the biggest shovel-ready project around. Of course, that has gotten a bad, that term has gotten a bad name recently because of the Obama stimulus, but it's a true shovel-ready uh, program. It would be 20,000 jobs in America. In, in America. It would be $7 billion of investment. And that's coming from private sources. That's not yep. the federal Pure government private. using our tax dollars. Not taxpayer dollars. Guys. That's private investment. And it would be 700,000 barrels of oil a day from Canada, one of our closest allies. Nobody so that hates a, us in Canada the way right. we got over in the Middle so East. So it's a win-win-win. Unfortunately, I think it's pure politics that have gotten in the way. President Obama is beholden to the far-left environmental movement, and he's vetoed it, at least for now, uh, with his re-election in sight because of that politics. And I really think it's just politics over people, and that's a shame. Let's, let's talk about, because you've had a, a proposal called the 3D program yeah. that deals with a way to create uh, a lot of energy for us, a lot of jobs for us, a lot of tax revenue for us. Explain to the folks what it is. Yeah, 3D stands for domestic jobs, domestic energy, and deficit reduction. And we can achieve all of those really important goals by increasing our domestic energy sector. That's a big part of our economy that we have artificially hindered uh, from Washington. Because of regulations. Because of regulation, because of putting stuff off limits. You know, like a lot of Americans don't know this or don't think of ourselves this way, but we're the single most energy-rich country in the world, bar none. It's bar amazing. None. We're way richer than Oil, Saudi gas, Arabia. gas, everything. Yeah, Saudi Arabia or any Middle Eastern country. We're the single most energy-rich country. The problem is we're the only country in the world that takes 95% of what we have and puts it off limits. It says you can't drill off the East Coast, can't do anything off the West Coast, can't touch the Eastern Gulf for now, can't touch most of offshore Alaska, can't do anything Anwar. And increasingly, this Obama administration is making it tougher and tougher to access these very rich shale fines in the Western states and other parts of the nation, including Northwest Louisiana. And, and so we're taking 95% of those resources, that richness, and putting it off limits. If we simply reverse that policy, access that energy in a clean, careful, responsible way, which we can do, we would grow jobs, we would grow domestic energy, energy independence, and that would produce a lot of revenue to lower deficit and debt. At the federal level, uh, that's uh, second only as a revenue source, second only to the U.S. income tax. So after the income tax, the only, uh, the next source of revenue in terms of dollars is royalty, is revenue off domestic energy production. Proven historically. And yeah. I remember reading last year that President Obama was given a billion dollars, I believe, to Brazil so they can develop their oil yep. and gas industry so we can buy it from them instead right. of I don't understand yeah, to, it. To me, as a Louisiana in particular, was galling when he went to Brazil and made speeches about wanting to support their industry. What about our industry starting in the Gulf of Mexico? I just don't understand it. Well, we'll continue this on the next segment. This is Locke Meredith, Legal Lines. Our United States Senator David Vitter we will be right back. Hello, I'm Locke Meredith, and I'd like to thank you on behalf of myself, Sean Fagan, and Corey Ogeron, and our entire staff for letting us come into your homes for the last 10 years via Legal Lines. We hope that you've come to a greater understanding of how the law works and how the government works for you. So from all of us, thank you. Welcome back to Legal Lines. I'm Locke Meredith, and again, we're extremely proud to have on the show today our United States Senator, David Vitter. David, again, thanks. Thanks, Locke. All right, we were talking about the energy component of our economy and how if we could access it and go after it, we would be able to generate a, a ton of jobs, oh, yeah. a lot of revenue, yeah. and, and we wouldn't be, independence. Yeah. wouldn't be hurting it's, the it's way a, we are. It's a threefer. I mean, you think about all of our big debates as a nation, and this is a partial solution, it's not everything, but it's a major part of the solution to our biggest problems. 
energy independence. We all want to be less dependent deal. on volatile parts of the world like the Middle East, folks who don't much like us. We want to get away from that dependence. Jobs, our top priority right now, trying to come out of this recession, is jobs. And those are great jobs. And jobs, by the way, which by definition, you can't outsource. If you have a domestic energy job, you're not sending it to India. That's right. You're not sending it uh, to other parts of the world. It has to stay here. And finally, deficit and debt reduction, which is a huge challenge. And again, revenue on domestic energy production is the second biggest source of revenue of the federal government, second only to the U.S. income tax. David, I want folks to know, too, that you have been fighting hard to get the Gulf opened back up yeah. so that we can get back to where we were. Yeah. It's been a long struggle. There was a moratorium and yeah. then a, permits weren't being issued and then it was real slow. Where are we in that? Well, we're making a little headway, but it's still a struggle, you know, and, and of course, all of this is coming out of the BP disaster. I remember you putting now, holds on his secretary. Yeah. Now, look, everybody agrees that coming out of the BP disaster, we needed to figure out what went wrong. We needed to make certain changes to make sure that never happened again. We needed to take a good, hard look at our regulation, which I think we've done. But after we do that, now that we've done that, we need to move on. We need to get back to producing good American energy out of the Gulf of Mexico. We're still not doing that to the extent we were pre I've read it's, we're down by a third. Yeah, exactly. Permitting is 30 to 40% below what it was before BP. Now, President Obama likes to brag, and he said it again in the State of the Union, that we're producing more energy domestically than ever. Well, that's true because of permitting of his predecessors, President because of Bush. what previous administrations did. Obviously, a permit takes a long time to come online and actually produce energy. But his permitting is still 30 or 40 percent below pre-BP levels. We need to get it back to that level and then grow from there and open up access to other domestic energy. Let's talk about the, the national security yeah. component to this, because you said it earlier, we're sending billions and billions and billions of dollars every year to Middle East countries, some of whom uh, are openly hostile yes. to America. Yeah. You know, our, our, our military men and women are all over the Middle East. Now, I'm not one of those uh, folks who says that's just because of oil, but clearly, clearly that region is more important to us because of the oil than it otherwise well, would be. We sent a carrier over sure. there to deal with the Strait of Hormuz because Iran's saying Absolutely. we're going to shut it down. Absolutely. And every day we send uh, boatloads of money off our shore to buy energy. That's very negative economically and in every other way. We should do everything we can to lessen that, and we have the resources here at home to make a major dent in that. Just the Keystone XL pipeline, which is from Canada, so it's not quite it's U.S. Good. energy, right. but it's pretty darn close. Uh, that's 700,000 barrels of oil a day. That just coincidentally is about the same amount of oil as we get from Hugo Chavez. Uh, we could cut that off. He hates our had, guts. Yeah, we could cut that off if we had the Keystone. We could dramatically decrease uh, the amount of oil we get from Saudi Arabia or other Middle Eastern countries if we had the Keystone. If we opened up domestic energy sources in a much wholesale way, we could make a lot of inroads in that direction. Let's talk about the, the Middle East and the wars that we have yeah. in Afghanistan and Iraq and the other Iran yeah. doing what they're doing, uh, threatening to de just destroy Israel. Yeah. Um, what are your views on what's happening to our military? I'm reading we're going to reduce the force by 100,000, yeah. uh, reduce the revenues by one trillion. I don't understand. Well, uh, like as I said on an earlier program, look, there's, there's fat and waste and abuse everywhere and everything needs to be on the table in terms of cutting spending and lessening deficit and debt, and that needs to include defense and the Pentagon. But we don't want to cut through fat into muscle and hit bone and really suffer from a national security point of view. I think we did that under President Clinton with the so-called peace dividend. Mm -hmm. Remember the peace dividend, the Cold War, war, war mm -hmm. was over, so I think we overreacted and cut a lot, and lo and behold, we had other threats, and that led to 9-11. And so we, we realized the hard way that there were a completely new generation of threats that were very real, 
in some ways even more dangerous. So we don't want to make that mistake again. We need to be careful about it. David, what are your thoughts on the fact that just Iran threatening to yeah. cut the Strait of Hormuz drives the oil prices up? Um, I mean, if oil prices, as I understand it, go up significantly, it can literally decimate our economy. We would be thrown back. Yeah, overall, decades. I think uh, the single biggest threat we face right now is from Iran. And um, Iran getting the nuclear bomb, which they're on the path to do, would make that threat a thousand times more dangerous. Not simply because you know they would use it on us the next day. I, I don't know that that would ever happen. But first of all, it would empower them, make them much more significant in the Middle East. Secondly, it would immediately lead to a nuclear arms race in the Middle East. If Iran gets the bomb, eight other Middle Eastern countries will get the bomb shortly thereafter. A tinder and that, Right, in the most volatile part of the world. And third, whether the Iranian government ever uses nuclear weapons, they have all sorts of ties to terrorist networks, and they would make that uh, technology accessible by terrorists and never have their fingerprints on it. And that, I think, would be the greatest direct danger to both Israel and the United States. In fact, I was reading that their, their top religious leader has basically sent out word, anyone who harms the, the nation yep. of Israel or the United States, we will support you. Yep. These are folks that, at least my understanding is, they want to, at least some of them, die killing as many um, Jewish folks or Americans as they can. Yep. How do you deal with something like that? Well, the first step, I think, is to recognize the threat and to take it seriously. We were talking about it. It's almost like yeah. we're back in the 30s yeah. with Hitler. Uh, to, to me, this is eerily similar to the 30s and Hitler. And Hitler was very explicit about his aims. He, he wrote was. a whole book about it. He put it in print. And yet, even after he did that, a lot of folks in the West and the United States said, oh, disregard that. That's just politics. That's just German politics. That's just his uh, playing up to a certain element of his society. Well, obviously his, history proved that talk as foolish, and we should have taken him at his word from the very beginning. I feel exactly the same way about Iran. They are very explicitly threatening the actual extinction of Israel, threatening direct attacks on the United States. And I think we need to take them at their word, particularly as they're on the verge of becoming a nuclear power. David, thank you so much for being thank on the Thank you, Locke, very much. I really, really enjoyed appreciate it. it. This is Locke Mayor with Legal Lines, and our guest, our United States Senator David Vitter, thanks for being with us.